government debt gets all the publicity. And we'll have, I hope, some important insights on government debt today. Poor old private debt, household and business debt combined. Poor old private debt is a second class citizen. That's in spite of the fact that globally, private debt dwarfs government debt in size. In fact, in the top 20 countries, private debt is almost $100 trillion, and government debt is only about $60 trillion. That's in spite of the fact that it was a doubling of mortgage debt from 2001 to 2007, from $5 trillion to $10 trillion in about five and a half years, that was the immediate proximate cause of the U.S. credit meltdown. That's in spite of the fact that GDP growth and outcomes correlate much more closely to private debt trends. And that's in spite of the fact that global economic growth continues to underwhelm because individuals and businesses continue to groan under the weight of still excessive private debt levels. Happily, there is a small, intrepid, and growing group of analysts and economists who give private debt its proper central place in economic analysis. We will hear from several of the finest today. And just as happily, we will also hear about the ongoing adverse, troubling impact of excessive government debt levels. Please let me introduce our panel. We have Professor Ursula Constantini, senior economist at the Institute of New Economic Thinking. We have Professor Steve Keen, author of Debunking Economics and Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? You'll have to read the book to get the answer. We have Professor Hashim Pesaran, Emeritus Professor of Economics and Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, and the John Elliott Chair in Economics and Distinguished Professor of Economics, University of Southern California. We have Professor Moritz Schulerich, Professor of Economics at the University of Bonn, and Lord Adair Turner, Chairman of INET and Chairman of the Financial Services Authority until 2013. We also have two discussants with us today, Professor Roberto Ciccone from the University of Rome and Professor Pontus Rindal, Professor of Economics at the University of Cambridge. A spectacular panel. Let's give them a brief round of applause before we ask them to speak. Join me, please. So we will ask uh, Ursula to start us off. Thank you. I'm sorry if I stand, but I'm rather short, and otherwise I just disappear in the, same, in the chair. Um, so sort of an underlying question of, uh, of my work here is whether high levels of, of uh, household debt consume or exhaust the conditions for investment and growth. And uh, we'll try to answer this question first by looking at some results of my empirical analysis of household finances in the US and then by discussing some macroeconomic causes and consequences of that. And the empirical study is based on the US uh, Fed survey of consumer finances from 1989 to 2016. And first, I would like to compare uh, two different ways to regroup households. And on, uh, uh, on your left side, <laughs> Uh, you actually have the debt-to-income ratio of uh, households by their total household incomes. And on the other side, you have the same debt-to-income ratio, uh, debt ratio by uh, the uh, per capita income within the family, the household. So it's the total household income divided by the number of members of the households. And only when you control for the uh, number of members, the bottom 50% has a higher debt to income ratio than the top. Or in these calculations, I'm just excluding the top 5%, which is substantially different from everybody else. 
And uh, another uh, stylized fact that emerges here uh, when you control for the number of households especially is that uh, uh, both groups really have a very similar debt to income ratio and this can be interpreted two ways. Uh, one way is that uh, both groups actually behave according to similar uh, financial preferences and the other way is to think that as a sign of what some uh, authors have called the dualization of the economy, and in which case you would see that one group actually, each group has different portfolios of debt, motives to get into debt, and different uh, levels of uh, fragility. And this second interpretation is actually uh, reinforced if we look at the percentage of families holding debt among uh, income groups, uh, uh, account, per capita income groups. And uh, in fact, the all quantiles really uh, show a, a substantial increase in the frequency of families that uh, ha hold that debt, hold debt. But the, uh, most pronounced, the most pronounced growth occurs in the first quintile and in the quantile between the 60th and 80th percentile. Uh, but especially after the crisis, this increase is not particularly due to mortgages. In fact, after the crisis, mortgages, the frequency of mortgages since actually uh, 2010 decreases. And for the first time in 2016, the frequency of credit card debt exceeds that of mortgages. Uh, the most indebted groups, that means that those who hold the highest real uh, mean value of debt, are the working groups, uh, the working house, the households whose head is working, actually. And especially it's true for the self-employed, and of course that's a very uh, diverse group because there are the self-employed who have a firm and uh, the self-employed who are contractors. Uh, but uh, in any case, we can say that there's a relevant uh, income variability for those uh, households. But what's most important, I think, to, to notice here is that there's a, a significant rise of the value of debt of the retired and those households who are older than 65 years of age. And um, this actually doesn't really stop this rise, this growth, even during the crisis year. And in fact, the relevance of elders with debt, with substantial amounts of debt, is becoming uh, significant. And um, this is caused by essentially two factors. One is that they take on new debt, and because households take longer to pay off their debt. And in fact, uh, the second uh, um, the second factor is uh, explained and represented very well if we look at the education loans. So these are divided by per, per capita income in the, in the household and by age. And um, well, we see there's an explosion of the value of, house, of the educate, education loans, but those start already uh, to pick up also for uh, older uh, cohorts of the population. And since the, the explosion of education loans is rather uh, recent, this phenomenon is likely to continue and intensify, especially if there's not a change, a substantial change in the income distribution. And uh, most, um, most simply, I mean, the, if there isn't a change in the uh, connection between the investment in education and the ensuing uh, wages uh, or anyway income of households um, uh, from that. And um, this is uh, the idea that there, that connection is missing is uh, confirmed if you look at debt to income ratio by uh, the level of education of the head of the family. And we see that the most uh, educated also hold the, the highest debt to income ratio. And the debt to income, and again, the trend picks up after 2001. And that is the beginning of a decade of really unprecedented stagnation in wages. And, uh, but where does financial uh, fragility reside? reside, reside? Uh, so we see that, uh, of course we know that uh, the dynamics uh, of the housing prices, the housing prices crash, was a, a huge factor of fragility for the upper middle class. But we, here we see also, and in fact they were the ones that experienced more frequently bankruptcy in those groups. 
but also we see here that they were those who were also fired more often. So the labor, uh, insecu the labor market uh, uh, insecurity uh, was also a factor in, in that. And in fact, those were the upper middle class also were mostly late in their payments more than other uh, groups. But we see that the financial difficulty was really spreading, uh, is spread across quantiles. If you look at uh, when spending exceeded income or equal income. And how do they make up the difference? Obviously in a range of ways, but uh, of course borrowing. And um, uh, unfortunately the option of postponing uh, spending is considered incoherent in the survey, although it would make some sense because it seems like from other uh, re empirical results that people are in fact postponing a lot of expenditures, especially healthcare, which is quite uh, worrisome. Uh, I don't have time, of course, to show all my results, so just let me uh, summarize some of those uh, before I go to the macroeconomic consequences of that. So the bo bottom 50% of the per capita income distribution holds less debt in value, but carries the highest debt to income. And despite the crisis, its total non-mortgage debt kept growing. And also the home ownership rate declined for that group. In 2016, as I said before, the post-crisis reduction of indebted people reverted, and the frequency of credit card debt exceeded for the first time since 1998 the uh, frequency of mortgages. Education loans and the debt of the retired and disabled grew regardless of the crisis. The crisis had no effect on the uh, debt. And um, the uh, group between the 60th, 60th and the 95th percentiles, and as well as the most educated in the population, hold the uh, highest uh, number of mortgages and that in general. Um, uh, as uh, far as the uh, top 5% instead is concerned, the crisis, crisis did not affect significantly, or, or at least for a long time, their finances. They keep uh, getting into that a lot, but for equity extraction purposes mainly. Uh, my take here in my paper, which <laughs> I mean, is, uh, treats this in much more detail, is that all this was policy driven. And this, uh, uh, had, in fact, policy had a direct effect through incentives for households to get into debt, deregulation of key markets, such as financial markets, so being able for uh, households to get into debt, but also very powerful and indirect uh, effects, such as the privatization of key markets, the school system, for instance, and also the pension uh, reforms that uh, most importantly, uh, made households in, uh, increasingly switch from defined benefits to defined contribution pension funds. And defined contributions, as you know, make it harder for households to, uh, to uh, access, to prepare for, um, for retirement. And uh, one uh, last comment about this is that the strife for residential wealth is a typical result of greater income and wealth insecurity. So also the house and the mortgages, the increase in mortgages is due to inequality. Uh, the macro consequences, we know that uh, um, you know, there's a fundamental asymmetry between public debt and debt of firms and debt of households because only the first create the condition through debt for their debts to be repaid. Um, uh, however, uh, well, we can see that in a context of inequality and loss of good jobs, we can say household debt really sustained revenues of firm, notwithstanding the, the inequality and the loss of relative wages. But firms did not invest in turn. So there was no growth, uh, increase in growth, there was no increase in employment. And uh, how is that possible? We've seen that graph that I borrowed from a paper by uh, Bill Lazonic, that house, uh, firms were actually uh, funding financial markets rather than borrowing from them. And this is uh, due to uh, how a wide literature um, uh, explains by the new uh, corporate model of downside and, and downsize and distribute, and the idea that, and especially the practice of um, uh, stock buybacks. And However, I mean, this, this system seems unsustainable. How can it persist, however? How, how could per this persist for decades? 
uh, my take is that uh, the reason for this persistence lays in the interaction between public and household debt. Not only, as I said before, public policies encourage that, but household net borrowing and net public spending interacted just like uh, internal export, as defined by Rosa Luxemburg and Mikhail Kaletsky, uh, which uh, explained that uh, they were just talking about net public spending, but I argued that there is this interchangeable function of the two borrowings uh, that helped uh, helped maintain uh, this system per, uh, stable uh, a uh, more for more for longer than it would be have been otherwise. But I will argue that an important aspect of this spending, when spending comes in and and help the sustainability of the system in times of emergency, has a very uh, pol important political uh, reasoning and logic behind it, which is what uh, Federico Caffè, an Italian economist, expressed in terms of economic alarmism. That is, it's most convenient to reduce prudential economic interventions in order to take advantage of the emergency to apply measures that do not command democratic support by depicting them as necessary. Thank you, Ursula. Yeah. <clears throat> Next, we will hear from Professor Steve Keen. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ignore government debt and make the argument that capitalism's crises have always been crises of private debt. Once I see the screens up there, let's see how we're doing. I'm still waiting. I saw it down here, let's see. Great, okay. This is a reconstructed data set, the red line showing the private level of debt in America, private debt to GDP, and the blue line showing the annual change in that debt. This is data put together by backtracking from Federal Reserve data uh, starting in 46, going back through census data back to 1834. So the blue line shows you the annual change in debt. I define that as credit. So debt is denominated in dollars, and credit, which has changed in debt, denominated in dollars per year. When you take a look at that chart, you can see there have been three extreme crises in capitalism in American capitalist history, each of them involving a period of negative credit, so change in debt being negative. That's the first is the Panic of 1837, which is a bit far back in history, but it's there. Of course, the Great Depression needs no introduction, and we know we carry the most recent experience we call the Great Recession. Now, if you look at the scale of what happened in private debt at that time, the, to change in credit, there was a violent swing from a very high level of credit for an extended period of negative credit. And that's what distinguished each of those experiences from any of the normal, relatively normal business cycles that capitalism experiences. In 1837, the change was from a credit being, on an annual basis, 12% of GDP to minus 9%, so about a 20% swing around, and that period of negative credit lasted for seven years. The Great Depression was from plus nine to minus nine, and that was an eight-year period where credit was negative for most of the period. There was a short interregnum before Roosevelt re triggered it back, well, what we know as the Roosevelt Recession, when the private sector went back into deleveraging in response to the government attempting to run a surplus. And our most recent experience, uh, had debt going from, probably that's, that's got the wrong date, it's been, uh, I've got 1837 there, my mistake. Uh, the Great Recession uh, starting, of course, in 2007, God knows why I made that typo, uh, from plus 15 to minus six. So again, a 21% turnaround, and the period of negative credit lasted three years. Now, if you look at the relative size of those down arrows I've got there, that's a fairly good indicator of the relative force of that crisis for capitalism. Now, mainstream economics ignore this completely because they have a fantasy. I'm actually work, I've actually done a cartoon set uh, coming out shortly with a cartoon illustrating some of the, uh, uh, the most popular fantasies in mainstream economics. And the particular fantasy here is that private debt doesn't matter. This is quoting Ben Bernanke uh, from his essays on the Great Depression. And he did his own new Keynesian rework of Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory of Great Depressions, but fundamentally he argued it doesn't matter. It's just a redistribution from one group to another. And Paul Krugman wrote most recently, in a little debate some of you may have seen with me on the, on the blogosphere, said individual banks do, in fact, have to lend out money it receives in deposits. I'm delighted to say, rather than having to quote good friends of mine like Basil Moore, 
uh, to make the case against it. I can now quote central banks, including the Bank of England, directly contradicting that fantasy and saying banks lending creates deposits. They do not lend out the deposits they've got, they create deposits by lending. And most recently, much to my amazement and delight, I can now quote the Bundesbank on the same point, saying this refutes a popular misconception. Now normally when we talk about a popular misconception, we mean something the public believes the experts know is wrong. This time round, it's something most of the public has some handle on that the experts believe, which is wrong. It's time we got rid of those experts, quite frankly. Central Bank of Norway as well. Banks create money out of nothing and withdraw it when loans are paid. Now, to show why that matters, I want to give a very, very little simple example here of an econ economy called Tom Dick Haria. Okay? Any three sectors you like, agriculture, industry, whatever you quote to call it, one sector's spending is another sector's income. That's the identity of expenditure and income, which we still have not got through to politicians. And if you have Tom spending $200 per year, which is the red, the diagonal, the red on the diagonal, that becomes income for Dick and Harry. So the negative sum of the diagonal of this expenditure income matrix is GDP measured from the expenditure level. The off diagonals are the same measure by income. They're necessarily equal. So $600 of expenditure, $600 of income. Now, if you have loanable funds, so Dick lends to Tom, which is the fantasy that uh, Paul Krugman in particular uh, uh, promotes all the time, then I'm now going to show this going, a transaction going along the diagonal itself. So Dick, rather than spending 10 on Harry and on Tom, respectively, lends that, Tom to, uh, that 10 to Dick, to Tom, pardon me, I'm getting my Tom, Dicks and Harrys mixed up, uh, lends to Tom, who then spends on Harry. So that's the 10 transfer of money, that's the type of fantasy that Bernanke was saying is what's involved, the pure redistribution. And of course the reason Dick lent to Tom is he wants to get the income, which is one dollar going back again, so that actually increases income to 601. It's still expenditure equal to income. Now what's the real world? Well that's where you borrow from a bank, and I don't show the actual bank lending on the table here, but you have a loan which increases the assets of the bank, that becomes expenditure, which is income uh, of, for Harry. So in this case, Tom borrows 10 from the bank. There is no offsetting cancellation of that. The bank is doing it, of course, to earn the income, but Tom is doing it to spend on Harry. So the extra time dollars of borrowing becomes income for Harry as well. Income for the bank as well, because that creates the income interest flow that's paid. And if the bank then spends that money back again, you get 612 out of it. So the change in debt, the credit, that matters. And that's what's ignored by mainstream economists. Now they're ignoring data that's in full sight. And this is why it takes special blinkers not to see what's happening in the economy. Because remember Banky said there should be no macroeconomic impact from change in debt. Well in that case there should be a rough correlation between a macroeconomic variable like employment and credit should be roughly zero. The blue line is credit, the red line is uh, uh, the red line is credit, the blue line is unemployment in America. Correlation coefficient there is minus 0.91 from 1990 forward. It's minus 0.63 from 1980 forward. It's overwhelmingly obvious there's some relationship and that's what's being ignored by mainstream thinking. Equally the same thing happens in the mortgage market. If you look at the change in new mortgages and the change in house prices, not only is there a strong correlation between the two, one thing I didn't expect to find given the fact that range of causality is a very linear test, this is a highly non-linear relationship, we found that if you did the Grange of causality test, the p-value for debt causing house price change was 0 0.003, which is fairly significant, in the opposite direction it's 0.15. So the argument is again statistically confirmed, which again I did not expect given the nature of linear statistics, acceleration of mortgage debt causes change in house prices. You can't ignore it in the economy, you can't ignore it in finance either. Equally with margin debt, when you look at the level of margin debt and compare that to the share price market in America, that's, that's the correlation of the absolute level of margin debt as a percentage of GDP, which is the red line, with the absolute value of the Schiller, the Schiller uh, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. I think you can see a relationship there. Now the causal fact, and also you can see a dramatic increase in margin debt from running at about 0.5% of GDP right up until 1995 to 2.5% since 1990, 2000. 
So we're in uncharted territory, and it's happened under the watch of economists who collect this data. This is looking at the annual acceleration in margin debt and the change in that S&P index. Again, an extremely high correlation, which according to mainstream finance theory, Medigliana Miller, that should be zero. So we're ignoring the obvious cause of the financial volatility of capitalism. We have to reverse a mistake we've made as a result of that, of letting private debt reach levels which are simply unprecedented in the history of capitalism. The red line there is the American data I've already shown you. The blue is the British data starting from 1880. Notice that the British data never exceeded 75% of GDP until two years after the election of Maggie Thatcher and the deregulation of the financial sector. It's since has hit 190% of GDP. Japan was the canary in the coal mine we all ignored, despite talking about it. And the euro area equally has got itself trapped in the highest level of debt it's ever had as well. That's the real cause of the stagnation we're experiencing. So we have to reduce the level of private debt. Forget about obsessing about government debt. It's private debt that matters. This is what we're ignoring. It's why we're in stagnation. So how do we do it? Well, my suggestion there is what I call QE for the people. I'm not the first person to use that title. That is the idea of using the government's central bank's capacity to create money to inject not into financial sector accounts, but directly on a per capita basis into household accounts. Those who have debt get their debt reduced. They don't actually see the cash. Those without the debt get a cash injection. Now we could use that as well and say that has to be used to buy corporate shares, which were then used to cancel corporate debt. So there's mechanisms we could do to use to reuse this effectively without having to cause a second or third world war, which of course, unfortunately, that's the way we reduce the same levels of debt or similar levels of debt back after the Great Depression. And we'd also reverse the income inequality that's been generated by this whole process. The private debt bubble in the first instance dramatically increased inequality. What central banks did, which was pretty much falling into their usual behavioural uh, basis of trading just for the finance sector, that actually increased inequality as well because the massive injection of government created money through central banks quantitative easing increased share prices and the people who own shares are the ones who benefited. That's a dramatic increase in inequality caused by government policy. Now we could reverse that by doing what I'm talking about which is giving that same money to the public on a per capita basis so Rupert Murdoch would get the same amount of money that I get it'd be slightly more worthwhile to me than to Rupert. Now, if we don't do that, what I think we're going to continue seeing is what we've seen for the last few years, political turmoil, because the voters are the ones who are suffering from this. Capitalism has democracy. They are not necessarily compatible. And what we've done is enhance the power of a revolt against the oligarchic system we're part of, that we call, we call them democratic, the public are telling us that unless they benefit from this, they're going to be revolting. They're going to throw human hand grenades into political theatre, which is what has actually happened. Now, partly why we've ended up getting here is because we have a theory of economics that is non-equilibrium, is equilibrium dominated and not, doesn't include debt at all. I've shown that I can simply take three definitions, the debt to GDP ratio, the employment rate and the wages share of GDP and generate a model with two possible outcomes in a complex systems world. One is that if you have a low level of desire to invest by capitalists, you reach stability over time. That's the sort of world neoclassicals think we live in without understanding the time dynamics. But slightly more aggressive capitalists mean they borrow money to finance that investment and this is the effect you get. You have a great moderation followed by a crisis. They are the same process and one was a warning of the other. We need to rebuild macroeconomics so we can see that, get rid of the equilibrium fetish that we currently have and start doing dynamic nonlinear modelling, which is possible with technology which has now been around for 50 years. I've added one more tool called Minsky. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Hashim? Thank you so much. Uh, I also like to acknowledge INET because I'm also the director of uh, INET Institute at USC. Uh, my talk is about public debt, so it would uh, most likely compliment, although I have no comments on the previous speakers. Uh, now, this is based on uh, the work I've done with other colleagues. Uh, I will uh, show you the papers which uh, this presentation based on and some work in progress. Uh, I'm really addressing two very narrow issues, but they are important in my opinion. One, is there a threshold? Uh, as you know, Rogoff and 
uh, his colleague, has been advancing some of these ideas, uh, especially during the, uh, which led to the austerity. So that actually triggered me because I wasn't happy the way they did it, so I tried to understand myself. So I'm going to show you the result we obtained. The second is, un under what conditions, uh, <laughs> if the debt, uh, here by debt I mean public debt to GDP, uh, rises or falls, uh, under what condition it affects the uh, output growth? Um, because it's not necessarily the case that it always goes the same way. Uh, this, the papers, one is came out in Review of Economics and Statistics, uh, which uh, the threshold example is, and some of them are more theoretical, <laughs> econometric background to it. And also I'm going to present new results, uh, which we are writing in a paper using my global VAR, which I'm going to talk about. Okay, so where is the, the discussion, there has been, especially during these last 10 years, uh, we know after 2008, uh, especially industrialized economies, uh, the debt to GDP, public debt to GDP has been rising and in the US is now over 100% and in Europe, apart from Germany, has been rising everywhere. The question was raised by Rogoff in a, a short article non-refereed article, I should say, in 2008, American Economic Review Proceedings, which, in 2010, I mean, and he argued that there is a, this magic 90% threshold that if uh, the debt goes above it, that is going to be detrimental to growth. And that led to a lot of pressure of austerity, which my view was, had a really negative effect because the research was faulty itself. Now, the way the Rogoff did it is they didn't have any uh, statistical, formal statistical framework. I really recommend you have a look at the paper. I just explained it in words. They, been the, they looked at many countries uh, in a, what's called unbalanced panel, so they had not the same data across all countries, uh, but nevertheless, they bin them uh, according to the growth rate, average growth rate over the period they observed them, uh, into different uh, areas of a debt to GDP threshold below 30%, between 30 to 60%, uh, and uh, 60 to 90%, and above 90%. And I showed that from this simple analysis that those countries where uh, debt to GDP was about 9%, they had a shortfall in growth. And therefore, they argued that there is a, this magic threshold, and that became crucially important in a lot of uh, debates. And uh, now, there are a number of papers written follow that up. Some people found some data error in it, but I don't think these are the issue the result is, if you do it the way they did, is, co is correct. Uh, if you change some of the countries, you get a different answer, but you get this effect. But trouble was that when I looked at their analysis, it's faulty because they dealt with heterogeneous group of people. You, when you pool people, and there are very different experiences. For example, if you look at emerging economies, they can't borrow that much. They don't have the system to borrow. So the debt doesn't go up, the inflation, they monetize, the monetize, the money supply goes up and inflation follows. But in the US economy, democracies, they can borrow uh, and their, their debt goes up. So therefore, mixing these two kinds of countries, really not right. So what we did, we then uh, looked at uh, how do we uh, deal with these kind of issues and in the process, we also came up with a, a different way of looking at the threshold itself. Uh, so what we did, there are two thresholds. The threshold that econometric you can write down, tau is the threshold, and the reason we use log of tau is because di is the log of debt to GDP. So we want to look at the log of debt to GDP relative to the tau, which could be 60%, 70%, and it turns out that actually what matters is the second threshold, which basically says that debt to GDP threshold matters if debt to GDP is growing. In other words, if you have a growing debt to GDP and you also go above a threshold, you're more likely in the short term to be affected by this. Uh, this basically means that you need to convince the financial market if your debt is too high, you should make sure that debt to GDP doesn't rise too fast because then they get worried and there would be financial crisis or uh, implication of financial effect. So with, anyway, this is the econometric model. We also allow for heterogeneity. And more importantly, we found that you need to allow for global effect. What happens are spillover effects. If some countries uh, expand their economy through uh, debt financing uh, and it's not coordinated, uh, they may suffer. But if it's coordinated with other countries, it turns out the effect not as much. So therefore, there is a spillover effect across countries as well. 
So we do, we, we, there are a number of econometric issues we try, and we show that uh, if you look at 40 countries, uh, looking at as much data that it exists, which at the time we had 1965 to 2010, I'm going to extend the data to 2015, and we make sure that we have at least 30 years of uh, minimum amount of data for each of the countries, and at any moment of time, we never have less than 20 countries. It's important to have a, a proper balanced panel, otherwise your result depends on a particular country and so on. So the countries cover quite uh, all the Europeans, MENA countries, and many other uh, both uh, emerging and non-emerging economies. And we do a lot of heterogeneity across these countries, and the source of data is given here. People are interested, they, the slide is available, they could look at the source of data and also the paper. So what is the answer? The straightforward, the, the threshold does not exist. Uh, no matter what you try, you know, uh, we published in a mainstream journal, and we believe me, referees, and everybody else wanted to get a hole in it, they can't find any hole, and is the data is available to replicate, there is no debt. Uh, to GDP threshold, uh, which Rogoff uh, has emphasized. In fact, there's no evidence whatsoever. Now, however, if you go to the, this interactive threshold, which basically you interact the threshold with the growth of uh, debt to GDP, it says the maximum of zero and growth of debt to GDP. Delta D is growth of debt to GDP. The maximum, it means that obviously if it is zero, uh, if it is positive, uh, it would be high, that you would choose it. But if it's negative, in other words, your debt to GDP is declining, this indicator is zero, effectively. So because of that, what is important to notice that we do get a threshold which basically says that it comes from interaction, in other words, heterogeneity. Those countries whose debt to GDP growth is rising and their debt is high, they are going to have some negative implication. Although the, even this result wasn't that strong, uh, if you, it depended whether you separate the industrial economies from the rest, most of this action come from industrial economies, not uh, emerging economies. Uh, now, the second question was, uh, uh, wasn't debt to GDP sustainable? What is the right magic number? Is there a debt to GDP actually economic theory tell us? It's quite this equation I've written down uh, deals with all possible models of growth. So you may have a different view of the world. Maybe you want new, new, new Keynesian models. When you want, you want the neoclassical model, it doesn't make a difference. This is accounting identity. We says real debt is equal to the debt yesterday plus the interest you pay on debt and plus the primary deficit of the government, which basically is government expenditure minus taxes. It's called primary deficit. And that is going to go on. Uh, and uh, if you do it properly, then you divide by y and then do the calculation, you find that the most important thing is, this, no matter, it's a quite nonlinear dynamical model. If you then uh, do the proper analysis of this, you find that the stability of, or sustainability of that based on two important factors. One, the deficit to, you know, basically primary deficit to GDP has to be stabilized. This is obvious because you cannot have a country, the private, uh, the primary deficit as a proportion of GDP rises. It's not possible. So that's uh, usually uh, satisfied in most countries. Because if the countries get to that problem, they monetize, they issue money. They don't have to issue debt. Then uh, the other, the more important question is that the average growth rate uh, over the long period of time uh, should always exceed the interest you pay on a debt. Uh, so that's the key. Now, however, economic theory, if you read the neoclassical model and related studies, you find that the return to capital has to be larger than the growth rate, because this is the Paketti's point, that's it. The growth rate has to be larger, but then it is a puzzle. How come for debt sustainability, you need the interest on debt be lower than average growth rate, but return to capital, which private sector gets, should be higher than the growth rate? There is no uh, mystery about this. It's because the debt is the safe asset. Most financial uh, studies, I've got another paper I'm working on, they believe there is a safe asset. They don't say where the safe asset come from. Is the government creates the safe asset. Because it creates the safe asset, it can get borrowed from the rest of the world, including their own people, at a lower interest rate than growth rate. So therefore, if you test this, you find this equilibrium condition holds in most industrial economies. Although it may take a long time for it to hold. Let me just show you very quickly uh, uh, some data in terms of uh, over time. These are uh, data on debt and uh, output growth across industrial economies, US, Japan, and so on. You find that they're moving together, 
but there are huge, there are periods of big gap between the two. In econometric jargon, we say they're trending with each other. We call them co-trending. But what they don't do, they don't co-integrate. Because one of the problems in this data is that it's highly persistent, it's integrated of order one. And because they are uh, integrated, you could have a period like a, like a uh, uh, random walk. There are period, uh, episodic period, where the debt rises above the output and then falls below it. What is interesting is that uh, then uh, you find that there is not possible for this to happen systematically. Because usually, if you look at the growth of debt to GDP and related to output growth, you should get zero value in equilibrium. Because debt and GDP has to rise together. But can debt rise forever above the GDP? The answer is no, it's not sustainable. Can it fall below the GDP forever? No, because then there is no debt and there is no safe asset. So therefore, there would be episodes where we have a period where output, basically, debt rises faster than GDP and the period falls below that. And that, we have done some studies. I don't have time to go through econometric, but I'll just show you some graph. This shows you that if there is a technological shock, a real output growth rises and that debt GDP falls. So in other words, a good, good, good shock because it basically helped both. But you have also a physical policy shock that in that case, output rises, but debt to GDP also rises as well. So therefore, the bottom line here is that it, 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 the issue is not whether debt is good or bad. Debt is good because it creates safe asset, but it should be balanced with the GDP. And if you are deviating from one side, you have to match with the other side. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Um, well, thanks for having me. And since this is a session about debt, I will start by acknowledging my debts. And it's not a debt trap, but they're good debts. First debt is to INET for uh, bringing us together here and uh, sustaining, creating this amazing community. And also for funding our research over the years and uh, making a lot of this possible. The second debt is to my co-authors, uh, mainly to Alan Taylor and Oscar Jorda, who have traveled with me uh, along the way uh, in this research. So. Um, let me start by talking about the history of this, of this research. I think when, uh, when we started, and it's, you know, it's widely acknowledged that debt and balance sheets were sort of the, the great absent um, variables from macroeconomics until the crisis. And it's worth asking why that was the case. And one reason is that um, sort of macro in um, the, the profession of sort of mainstream macro thought that the details of financial intermediation were not that relevant. And I think it's fair to say that has changed now. People take that very seriously. There's hardly a model uh, now out there that doesn't have like some form of financial frictions. The other reason is you can also ask like there's all this literature on the consumption function. You know, macro was, pride to, was, pr was proud to micro found its, its uh, behavior of households and firms. So, why when people were like looking at household micro behavior, why weren't they realizing that something was going on with debt? And the key reason here is that I think people made it a shortcut that was not that, like if you think about it now, it's, 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 it wasn't that innocent with the benefit of hindsight, but it was not outrageous. The, the, the shortcut was to essentially to assume that what matters is household net worth for spending, for financial decisions. So there wouldn't be a difference in that shortcut between a household that has 50,000 euros in the bank and a household that has assets of a million, a debt of a million and assets of a million and 50,000, right? So they would just take this together and both have the same net, both are the same net worth households and they were expected to behave very much the same way in macro terms. Okay, we found out now that that's not the case. Um, and I think this is the bigger, um, the greater construction side, um, still like if you have, uh, if you come across models that actually arrive at sort of a reasonable gross positions on the household balance sheet and can explain them, I'd be very interesting to hear that. But the result, the upshot of all of that was that when we started this research, there was very little in terms of long run uh, trends in debt, very little information on on household debt, on, on bank lending and its composition. And we've spent sort of an, 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 the better part of the last decade in filling a lot of gaps there. Uh, what we ended up with is something that I sort of 
uh, would recommend you to take a look at, which is a database that has, uh, you know, it's uh, again a debt also to INET that uh, helped uh, fund this database that's out there in the internet that contains for 17 advanced economies since 1870, so almost 150 years. I think most of the macro variables that you would be interested in. It has not only GDP consumption, it has, it has household debts, it has uh, the breakdown of debt in, in, in mortgage lending and non-mortgage lending and aggregate debts. It has interest rates, short term and long term. It has investment consumption. And I promise you, it has virtually, it has very few gaps. So this is sort of the, the universe of macroeconomic data, macro financial data that we have for the long run and that's out there and uh, free for you um, and, and for you to use. And you don't need to send an email to anyone. You can just download the data and go there. So what do these long-run data show? Well, first of all, is uh, that's also the title of the talk, The Great Leverage Insight. What's been happening is that um, private debt um, sort of debt, private household credit, lending to households or debt of the household or the, the non-financial private sector has grown very strongly. So to the question of the panel here, is it the, uh, the public debt side or the private debt side, uh, the long-run data give a very simple answer, a very straightforward answer, which is that it's been mostly the, the debt growth the, has been on the private side. That's the red line here in that chart. And you see that in the second half of the 20th century, there's this very strong, like almost like hockey stick-like increase in um, the uh, in bank. This is bank lending to the non-financial private sector. This is to companies and households. The next step, we sort of drill deeper and ask, what was behind, what's behind that increase in private debt? And I think uh, Steve has mentioned it, and, and, and Ursula as well, and this is, will be like nicely complementary, um, is again, it's the red line. Uh, it's the mortgage, it's mortgage lending that has been driving that sort of secular rise in, in debt levels in Western economies. Maybe I shouldn't say Western, I should say advanced economies. So Japan and, and, and is in, in the data set as well. Um, you, you might say, like, look at the blue dotted line. That's non-mortgage lending. That's essentially business. That's essentially bank lending to business. That's your, your textbook model of what banks are supposed to do, collect deposits from households and then lend them on to businesses. And if you zoom in just on the 19, just look at the 1910 level, uh, you'll see, like, on average, bank lending to business, to GDP, is some, maybe around 50% on the eve of World War I. If you jump forward, like, 70 years to... Uh, 2000, 2005, we're maybe at 55, 60%. But you can easily say that in a century, not much has happened to um, the, the side of bank lending to the corporate sector. Uh, all the, um, the action has been on the mortgage side. And that's what we do um, in, in a table here. Don't, you know, it's far too many figures. The point of this table is just to show you, look, look with me at the, the bottom two lines. Um, the, the table details the increase in bank lending to GDP ratios over the past 50 years and tells you what share of the increases come from uh, real estate, from unsecured lending, from lending to households and lending to business. And the story is very clear. The, the, the big rise in um, debt levels and in, in, in lending to the private sector has come from lending to households for the purpose of real estate financing. Yeah, so it's really like the elephant in the room is, uh, is real estate debt, is mortgage debt. Um, of the total increase, the total increase has been around 80 percentage point of GDP and 71%, um, more than 70 per percent of that increase has come from um, real estate lending to households. Um, I think that's what we know. If you want to explain what's going on here. Uh, um, there's a next frontier. And I think that next frontier is exactly what Ursula uh, already started our panel with. It is to go to microdata. Because if we, wanted to, if we want to say something about how the distribution of debt has changed, how um, in the interaction of uh, asset prices and lending, as was what Stevens talked about, if we really want to drill down and, and say, be able to say with some certainty we understand what's going on here, um, we need to have household level information to um, to have a closer or to have a better understanding of what's going on. The macro data will just get us this far, and there will be always a lot of stories that we can tell with this macro data, but, you know, I think we, we all want to get a little bit more closer. So let me, let me take, uh, take my last five minutes to briefly run you through three applications of a new micro data set that, we're, um, a bit, uh, that we've put together. Uh, which is, connects perfectly with Ursula's work because she uses the survey of consumer finances starting that you can download from the Fed uh, that starts in 1983 
Uh, what we found in the, in the data archives of the University of Michigan were historical waves of that survey of consumer finances going back all the way to 1948. And who, those of you who doesn't, don't know the, the, the survey of consumer finances, that's really that's a representative survey of the American population, so there's going to be only U.S. data now, um, that covers everything you want to know about household financial positions, assets, debt, and income and a lot, of soci a lot of demographic characteristics. So if you're interested in, in, in the, the question of debt and, and, and race, gender, it's all in there, yeah? Um, so we coded these historical surveys going back, and the, the first question we asked ourselves is, um, um, also I referred to it, uh, has the distribution of debt changed? So is there a tendency in the American economy over the past 70 years that poor people owe more debt. You all have Raghuram Rajan's story, I think, still present, which you know, links increasing inequality to debt accumulation. Is there something in the data that tells us the distribution of debt has changed um, over time in a major way? So here's the first chart. It shows you just the total debt outstanding in the U.S. economy, household debt outstanding in the U.S. economy, and what share of, the, of, the, of, of what share of that total debt is owed by different income quintiles. So you have the um, incomes, the, the smallest 20%, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, and greater than 80. And like, just look with me kind of at the, at the overall pattern of the data. Um, there isn't a great change, like something like that jumps out of you, out of the, of the, out of the data jumps at you in terms of changing distribution of debt. Yeah? Rich households owe the largest share, and those shares have remained roughly stable. Um, but what about debt to income ratios? We know that the income distribution has become more skewed, so rich people, or the richer parts have higher incomes. Has there been a big change in debt to income ratios? And this chart breaks it even down into two components, the housing debt and non-housing debt. And again, debt to income ratios have risen in America. They've risen across the income distribution. Yeah? Um, but it's, it's hard, and, and maybe there's been a little bit more of an increase of non-housing debt, and this is, is part of the, the, um, the student loan um, issue in, on, on the, uh, sort of for low-income households. But overall, same story here, not a big shift in, in the distribution of debt over time. The next question, maybe the most interesting before I, I come to fragility, is has the life cycle pro profile of debt changed? Have households um, over time changed their behavior? What we can do with these long-run data is we can construct cohorts, and we can, we can follow birth cohorts over time. What you see here are the different birth cohorts over time, that's the age when we start tracking them, 30, 35, 65, for these different, um, for different birth years, and you see that's in 10-year 10 10 year intervals. And if you look at the lowest line, that's the, that's the cohort of Americans born between, with the, with the, with the circles, starting at 0 0.4 on the very left-hand side, that, um, that's the birth cohort of Americans born between 1915 and 1924. And you see a classical hump-shaped pattern. Yeah? They start at the age of 35 with some debt accumulation, then it's, it goes up over lifetime, and then they reduce it uh, over time when they go into retirement. And now you see, like, going, going through, through generations of Americans, how that uh, cohort time profile has changed over time. And there are two, there are two, um, there are two important insights here. One is, yes, people start originally with higher debt levels, but maybe even more interestingly, the life cycle profile has shifted. Just look at the older cohorts of Americans. People are 65 now, and they're no longer reducing their debt. And that's one of the key insights that comes out of these microdata, is that today, uh, unlike before, Americans die with a lot of debt. Or you can say, banks in America give 30-year mortgages to people who are 70 and 75 years old. Yeah, there's no reduction down the life cycle. The last point what we can do with, with these microdata is we can stress test household balance sheets and we can see which parts of the population are particularly vulnerable to asset price fluctuations. Uh, this here just shows you how, um, how big the losses are in million dollars to a 10, 20, 30 percent drop in house prices. Remember, there's been all this increase in leverage against house prices, so the effects of house price fluctuations are magnified. Um, and if we drill down to who are the most vulnerable groups, I think that's very compatible with what Orsley said before, it's mainly, it's, uh, the, most of the leverage sits in the, mid, sits in the middle classes, but you see that here, in percent of aggregate income in response to a 20% house price drop, um, the, the, the negative home equity in the system, sort of really the, the losses of individual households are up to 10%, um, up to 12% actually of that aggregate income group. Okay, that's it, thank you very much.
Lord Turner. Richard, thank you. And, and let me begin by just saying a word of thanks, uh, since you didn't have the opportunity, Richard, to you, uh, because Richard has played a, a very major role uh, in putting these issues of private debt uh, in front uh, of, of us all and encouraging people uh, to research uh, these uh, issues. What, what I'd like to do is simply highlight some particular areas of economic theory which either have already received or still need to receive more attention for us to think clearly uh, about these debt uh, issues. So R Richard began by talking about this extraordinary increase in uh, domestic credit, private credit as a percent of GDP, which has occurred over the last 50 years, and both Steve and, and Morris have shown uh, similar figures. And what's really interesting to me is that as that growth occurred, there was very, very little concern in mainstream economics about why it occurred. And I think, and this has already been said essentially by, by Steve and highlighted by Moritz as well, the reason why it didn't produce uh, a concern was that we had our theory wrong. And broadly speaking, there were two things that we were saying and that actually the textbooks are still saying about what banks do and what bank lending is, which are just wrong. We still have economic textbooks that broadly speaking say banks take deposits of money, apparently pre-existing money, and they lend it on to borrowers and that banks primarily lend that money to entrepreneurs and businesses, and they thus allocate funds between alternative investment products. And the simple fact is that as a description of what banks do in a modern economy, this lives on the same shelves of the bookshelf as Harry Potter. It's just nonsense. Well, Harry Potter's better written, okay. This is wrong. Banks, as Steve says, don't simply take pre-existing money. They create credit money and purchasing power that did not previously exist. And as uh, Moritz and, and his co-authors have shown absolutely brilliantly, they do not primarily lend it uh, to uh, entrepreneurs and businesses. Increasingly, uh, and this is from Moritz's and, and Oscar Yorda's and Alan Taylor's own figures, they increasingly lend it to real estate. Now. That then has a set of consequences. The consequences are that we can get wrapped in cycles of more lending, drives up real estate prices, drives more lending. You get to a high level of leverage at which there is a crisis. Post-crisis, there is an attempted uh, deleveraging by uh, particular overleveraged bits of the private sector. In that environment, the only way you can keep the economy going is by running fiscal deficits. But after a while, people begin to worry about the consequence of those fiscal deficits for public debt, which goes uh, up to offset the attempted deleveraging of the private sector. After a while, we therefore have attempted austerity, which drives the economies uh, into a recession. That, as I think Steve already said, is what we ought to have learned would happen from Japan, the canary in the mine that we ignored. And it seems to leave us stuck in a situation where we are today, where we have this unavoidable choice of either we accept sustained low growth and low inflation and debt burdens that never decline, or we have large debt write-offs, default and restructuring, but they are incredibly difficult to do without that itself uh, shocking the economy into a till deeper recession. That, after all, is how we really tried to deal with the 1929 problem of a debt overhang, and bluntly, it didn't end well, either economically or politically. Or we simply have ultra-low interest rates. We have debt erosions. Any level of debt is ultimately affordable if the interest rate is negative, but that needs, leads to more debt creation, and you never get out of it. So if we've ended up in this apparent position, because we ignored the growth of private debt, that then suggests two major policy questions. How should we have avoided getting into this mess in the first place, and how do we now get out of it? And I think to think clearly about that, we need, again, to go through some fundamentals of our theory better than we have uh, in the past. In terms of how to avoid getting into this mess, it's incredibly important to focus on bank balance sheets and monetary aggregates in a way that we didn't in the past, but with a very different focus than that which you had have got to from the quantity theory of money. There were people out there, for instance, at the Bundesbank, who always believed that bank balance sheets mattered, but what they were looking for was the danger that increase in money would lead to inflation. 
That idea, I think, is essentially uh, led us astray. It led us astray because we weren't thinking systematically and deeply enough about the fact that credit does different things. If all credit financed real investments in the economy, broadly speaking, you could assume that when you created credit, when you created a, a purchasing power, when you created money, that would stimulate nominal demand. And therefore, it would be true that if there was going to be a problem, ultimately, it would end up that you'd created too much of it uh, and there was inflation. But actually, once you realize that there are two other categories of credit in the economy, you can have problems that will never show up uh, in inflation. We can have finance for consumption. Now, finance by consumption might sound like it stimulates nominal demand, but if all that that is doing is offsetting the high marginal propensity of richer people in increasingly uh, unequal society, we can have very big increases in leverage, which will not produce an aggregate increase in monetary demand. They're simply making sure that it is adequate. But by far the biggest element of debt, of course, is finance of existing asset purchase. And it is quite possible for that to have no direct stimulus. Well, it has no direct stimulus to nominal demand. It can just increase credit, money balances, and asset pricing. And actually, there is very good evidence that what we see from the past is two different correlations. And these are figures taken uh, from work by Richard Werner, who shows that if you look at Japan uh, back in the 80s and 90s, there is a strong correlation between the debt which was extended to buy real estate prices at real estate and real estate prices, and a separate correlation between the debt that directly financed GDP transactions and nominal GDP. What that says is that we need to move way far away from standard monetary theory of the monetary theory, uh, 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 the quantity theory of money, in which there is some overall relationship between the stock of money and nominal GDP with velocity of circulation stable, and to move to what I call a quantity theory of disaggregated credit, in which there may be a, a relationship between the credit extended against real estate and real estate prices, and another separate correlation between the credit extended against non-real estate prices and nominal GDP. All of which means that monetary aggregates matter a lot, but on the whole, not because excessive money is a really robust forward indicator of inflation, but because excessive credit is a forward indicator of eventual crisis debt overhang, post-crisis depression, and, and deflation. And so when I talk to uh, friends and colleagues at the Bundesbank, I say, you were absolutely right to say that we shouldn't simply focus on uh, the short-term rate of inflation as the only indicator that central banks need to look at. You need to look at the aggregate bank balance sheets. But if you think they worried, you, that was problem because they were going to lead to inflation. You were looking at it in the wrong way. The second policy question is how to get out of this deflationary situation. And here, I think the most fundamental piece of theory we need is to go back to the question, where does aggregate nominal demand come from? By the beginning of last year, some people had convinced ourselves, themselves that we literally could not deal with a problem of a lack of aggregate nominal demand, that you had central banks which had reduced interest rates to the zero lower bound or even below. There were fiscal authorities that believed they were constrained. They couldn't run more fiscal deficits because public debt had already gone up. And people were saying, are we just out of ammunition? Are we stuck in this forever? Well, the most fundamental thing we need to realize is that there are very few problems in economics to which there is always an answer but inadequate aggregate nominal demand is one of those. You can always deal with a problem of inadequate aggregate money, monetary demand. And if we have a problem of inadequate monetary demand, nominal demand, that is a choice, not a necessity. Essentially, if you look across the major economies uh, today, uh, over the last five years, at those which at least have grown a bit more, and got a bit closer 
uh, to a, uh, the, uh, uh, th their inflation targets, those which have achieved a growth rate of nominal GDP. There is a very simple correlation. The ones which have grown nominal GDP faster are those which have had higher fiscal deficits. It's as simple as that. Now, the question then becomes, but why weren't these large fiscal deficits, for instance, by the US, offset by Ricardian equivalents? Why didn't all the US uh, taxpayers realize that they were going to have to pay for this in future? I think one of the most important papers uh, written in the last year on this issue was Christopher Sims' paper delivered at Jackson Hole last year, where he said loose monetary policy, ultra-loose monetary policy in a deflationary trap does not work through the transmission mechanisms which we normally describe, which is low interest rates stimulate investment. It works because and only because and only if it lubricates loose fiscal policy. I think the dirty little secret of what the Fed has been up to is that it has been using ultra loose fiscal policy to lubricate, uh, ultra loose monetary policy to lubricate uh, a fiscal expansion. It's been doing that by keeping interest rates low, even in the face of large deficits, so that you don't get a Ricardian, uh, a, a, a crowding out effect. But even if you believe there's a limit to that, ultimately loose monetary policy always has within it the possibility that it may turn out to be permanent. It may turn out to be a permanent monetization. And I think that takes us to the fundamental point that I ultimately think that there are two essential sources of nominal demand, one of which is private credit and money creation, the creation of inside money. The other is essentially sovereign fiat money creation now or expected in the future because people rationally not low that when you run a large fiscal deficit, and when you run a large QE pro program, there is a non-zero probability that that will turn out to be a monetization post facto. And I think one of the fundamental things that we need to go back to is the choice between fiat money creation and private credit and money creation. The modern orthodoxy has been that any idea of fiat money creation the monetary finance of fiscal deficits is so dangerous that it should be absolutely forbidden, or the better word here might be verboten, uh, given where the depth of the orthodoxy is. But the orthodoxy also has been that private credit and money creation, whatever the private sector does, it must be optimal because the private sector does it. I find it interesting to note that in the Chicago plan, back in 1935, a group of very clever economists actually ended up with precisely the opposite point of view. They believed that private credit money creation was so dangerous that it should be totally abolished in 100% reserve banking, and therefore had to believe that the way you achieve nominal demand growth uh, was by fiat money creation, which had to be constrained by rules but should be allowed. I think we have to realize that both of these ways of creating nominal demand have risks which have to be constrained, but we have to have a more sensible discussion about the balance between those two routes. Well, we've had five terrific presentations, very provocative uh, thinking by all of these esteemed individuals. We're fortunate to have two discussants, and we'll turn to the first, Roberto Ciccone. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think, think that uh, what uh, emerges from the papers, from the presentations of this session, perhaps except for <laughs> Professor Pesarans, uh, I will come to that uh, at the last, uh, is a need for uh, a theoretical approach different from the mainstream one. A theoretical approach in which demand is conceived as a fundamental determinant of the levels of activity, and I would include in that investment. This, however, requires going beyond. Can't, Steve can't handle it, he has to leave. <laughs> so, thank you, Steve, for your contribution. So. This require going, requires going beyond macroeconomics and rebuild, reshape the very basis of economic theory. I think uh, perhaps less agreement, the reason whether 
availability of finance or cheap enough finance is per se capable to stimulate economic activity. My view is uh, that the mere availability of credit is not sufficient to increase borrowing and spending. And this perhaps is consistent with the, with the endogenous money view. Uh, this is what I would have liked to ask uh, Professor Keen, but anyway, to, Professor, to Lord Turner, whether their views are consistent or not consistent with the idea of endogenous money. And more in particular, I think there is no general efficacy or lower interest rates in increasing demand and output. For this second point, there are good theoretical reasons. I cannot go deep into that, but, uh, besides uh, uh, empirical findings. Now, this perspective entails destroying some ideo ideological preconceptions erected against public deficits and debt. Uh, one of those, there are many, but one of those preconceptions is, in my view, particularly the idea of Ricardian uh, equivalence. Uh, there are several theoretical criticisms that can be addressed to the concept, but uh, what I note is that the data, the data, like those provided by Costantini and by Schurarik in their papers, showing that households are indebted even when old, conflict with the basic premise of what is Barrow's argument, the new reformulation of Ricardian equivalence, that is the diffused interest of living generations for the wealth to be transmitted to descendants. The ideological bias of many arguments against deficit spending and more generally state interventions um, relates to what I see as a very important point raised in Costantini's paper. Uh, the existence of ad hoc economic conceptions which provide theoretical support to policies by which dominant groups maintain and even increase their power and control over working classes. Thus the reduction of public expenditure and privatizations have been accompanied by policies favoring household indebtedness, in this way uh, sustaining aggregate demand. I note in addition, I don't know if uh, I go beyond what uh, uh, Constantinis would say, that substituting household debt for contractual or social wages, I, I mean welfare and public services, increases the economic and social costs of being fired hence weakens the power of laborers in the bargaining with masters, as Adam Smith called them, for working conditions. Finally, a few observations of Professor Pesan's paper in the, the general spirit of the paper. Um, in the paper, positive effects of public deficit on growth are conceived as limited to the short run, whereas for the long run, the paper privileges the possibility of a negative influence on growth because of several factors. The most relevant one is the crowding out of private investment. This is a very mainstream argument, of course, and which would have no general validity in the theoretical framework I referred to uh, before. Uh, in any case, the causal relation between that, the, that ratio and growth, as on the other hand the paper admits, could go in the other direction, uh, that is from a low growth of income to a rise, a high uh, debt ratio. And I would say that uh, in particular, thresholds of the ratio or the debt ratio could be used in another context in order to assess under what conditions higher debt ratios would react perversely from the orthodox standpoint to restrictive fiscal policies. Since the larger the debt relative to GDP, the larger would be the proportional reduction of GDP compared to that of the stock to debt, which would be caused, for instance, by given cuts in uh, public expenditure flows. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final discussant, Pontus Rindal. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's been a great conference so far. 
Uh, it's unfortunate that Professor Keane left because I actually had a question for him. Um, I think it's wrong to say that banks can create money out of thin air. If they could, we wouldn't need to bail them out, but we keep on bailing them out. Or they run out of thin air. Maybe the air gets suddenly very thick. Now what banks can create, so I'm gonna take Barclays because I, I have Barclays as my bank. Um, what, what Barclays can do when they give credit is they create Barclay pounds, Barclay money. Okay? Barclay pounds is a currency that is pegged to the British pound at a one-to-one -one exchange rate. Okay? So they promise the bearer of, or the holder of electronic Barclay pound to deliver British pounds if you would like to uh, obtain that. However, this is only possible for Barclays to do. Now, people trust the Barclay pound and the peg they are offering. They trust it because they have healthy assets on their balance sheet and they have reserves and they have capital. Okay? The moment those assets are not healthy or perceived as healthy, or the moment reserves are too low, there can be a run on the bank and there can be a run on Barclays. Okay? Barclay cannot create British pounds in the same way as the central bank of Zimbabwe cannot create US dollars. They just have a pegged exchange rate. Okay? So that's a, that's a misunderstanding that I think should be cleared up. Now, while it is true that Barclays can create Barclay pounds, they can maintain that exchange rate and they can expand the money supply, it's only true if, this, if the central bank is complicit with this. Okay? And as pointed out by several speakers today, the central banks have been complicit in a massive rise of credit in the last um, 60 years, particularly, and particularly in mortgage credit. And I think that there's been a failure from the central banks to look at growth uh, variables. They have been focused too narrowly on net variables. We all know the global, global net debt has to by construction be zero, okay? Gross debt does not have to be zero. And, and central banks haven't focused enough on gross debt. They should have, they have focused on inflation. I think Adair ha has a completely valid point that a lot of the credit that has been issued that has gone into housing has manifested itself as a, an increase in housing prices. House prices is not part of measure of CPI. Okay? Rents use, was for a period and, and are not anymore. Uh, and, and we have missed uh, that part of the story, and it's unfortunate. The last thing I want to say is that this session has been a session to a large extent saying that gross variables matter. Um, I think that's absolutely right. I think there's been too little focus on gross variables uh, from a theoretical point of view. I do work... Now, oh, before I say what I work on myself, I want to say that if, if we think that everyone is the same, if every, everyone was identical, a representative agent, okay, uh, gross is equal to net is equal to zero. Okay? That goes for debt. So debt, in a way, is a measure of heterogeneity. Okay? Debt only exists, gross debt only exists if there is heterogeneity and if there is inequality. So growing debt can be seen, well, partly can be seen as uh, efficiency of the banking system, efficiency of the information in the banking system, but partly can, reflects also uh, changes in heterogeneity, changes in inequality. Um, so while it is true that, so I want to make an observation, while gross variables seem to matter, it's also the case that gross variables reflect heterogeneity, reflect inequality, Inequality and heterogeneity matters as well. Okay. So when we see correlations between gross variables, like gross debt, and say unemployment or GDP, we also see a correlation between inequality and heterogeneity and GDP. And I think it will be important to disentangle to which extent gross, changes in gross debt reflect changes in underlying heterogeneity and to which extent it's an important variable on its own. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hashem, did you have a comment? Yeah, 
I don't agree with that. Uh, in a sense that even if you have a representative agent, uh, Arrow has a fantastic book in 1970, that if the economy is growing, you can have deficit accumulating so long as the ratio of deficit to GDP is constant. So therefore, in a growing economy, you can't afford to have debt. But if the economy is a stationary, you're right. No, no, okay, so, hold, can I, please? Someone must be holding that debt. So when you sum it. The, the government. There has the, to be. The government. Yeah, so the when, when you consolidate it, it's zero. No, no, the government is a difference, but you have to understand that uh, the government creates the safe asset. I, the I, government I, has to issue debt, otherwise there would be no safe asset. But so, so therefore, but actually, so, the government debt is a good thing in a logic. But someone must buy it. And that's well, the asset holders. So when no, you, they, they when you add a lower interest rate. That is why I was trying to prove to you that what they do, because the government has safe asset, basically the interest charge on UK gov US government debt, if you look at it, is only less than 1%, while the real return in the US economy is 6%. My opinion, so how come people my, lend money to the government? It's I'm not, because okay. it's safe. I'm just, I'm, my final word on this is I strongly believe that net, global net debt is zero. Uh, Lord Turner, do you have a comment on this? I just wanted to pick up the point as to whether banks can create credit and money out of, of, of thin air, because I'm not sure there is a disagreement uh, here. I mean, I think it is the case that somewhere in the system, you need either a money which is arbitrarily accepted as money by a social conventions like gold, or you need a money which has been created money by the sovereign saying, this is money. But with either of those as an element of the system, the banking system can take that and multiply it into more credit and purchasing power. And the point is that by how much it multiplies it is quite an unstable function and a fluctuating uh, function. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting function of many things. I think one of the greatest and ignored uh, by modern economists, uh, writers on this, is actually Knut Vixell. And Knut Vixell, in Interest and Prices in 1904, thinks about a banking uh, system. And he thinks about these individual banks in this banking system, which have reserves of ultimate money, which he thinks of as gold rather than central bank money. And he realizes that they can create a multiple of that in terms of loans and deposit money. But he then perceives that there will be a limit to that which is driven by liquidity, the danger that people will demand some of the absolute money uh, out and want to run around with gold coins or, or bits of paper. But then he has a one, wonderful chapter in which he, he imagines, well, what if there were only one bank? What if there were only one bank uh, and therefore for the whole uh, system, and therefore the only way to hold bank money was to hold it in that bank. You didn't have a choice uh, of going uh, to any other bank. Uh, and suppose it, we were in an electronic environment where it was hugely more uh, favorable to hold money in deposit form uh, than hold money in paper form. He worries that in a one bank system, there's no constraints because each of these, they don't have to be worried about somebody taking the money from one bank and taking it to another because there's only one bank. I think that actually one of the, some of the things that happens is when you have incredibly effective interbank liquidity systems, you become closer and closer to Vixel's one bank, but you also create a system which is then incredibly vulnerable to any crack of confidence. Uh, and I saw that crack of confidence as a regulator in a, a, a September, October 2008, when the global interbank money system, a, a, a interbank uh, system uh, dried up. And essentially, I think that what we happened there was we had a system which, although it had multiple banks, was operating like Vixel's one bank, and then suddenly started operating as if it was multiple banks, each of which uh, distrusted the other, with a, a collapse of, of, of confidence. So I think, I think you're right that somewhere in the system you have to have a money defined as money by either by social convention or, or by the state. But the crucial thing is the multiple of that, uh, and this is within the writing of Fisher, it's in the writing of Simons, it's, it's in the <coughs> writing of Hayek, the multiple of that which the banking system creates can be very large, can be very uh, variable, can increase a lot 
from irrational exuberance in the upswing and can go through a crash where it suddenly goes rapidly down. That, that would be my resolution. Great, thank you. Ursula. Yeah, no, um, my first comment uh, actually was already mentioned by uh, Adair, and I think there's a confusion between um, individual banks and uh, the sector of banks uh, as a total, and precisely this clash between the two things is what creates a, a loss of confidence in some situation. That's what uh, Keynes explains brilliantly in his A Treatise of Money, right? On, and on money. And um, on, uh, what uh, Roberto asked me, um, yeah, of course, I think there's a problem on the bargaining power uh, of workers. That I would definitely say that. And uh, that uh, has to do also with the Pontus' uh, uh, remark on the heterogeneity because, uh, well, uh, from another point of view, you could say that, for co of course, the capitalist system is based on an asymmetry, that there are some that hold the, the means of production and all the others. But uh, we also know that this conceives, <laughs> he has in itself the seeds of crisis. Uh, Moritz, do you have anything to add here? Or? Um, maybe just two quick comments. I think like I think it's clear like wherever the positions are, that it's more it's a little bit more complicated. There's also like someone who borrows. That's also you know it's not just that banks can push a button and create money. It's it's a complicated story. Um, the other point is like I'm I'm absolutely with with Pontus. I think the the big frontier is understanding gross positions on balance sheets yep. of households, and we don't do that. Like yep. just yep. give you an example. People have debt on the liability side. They have, on the asset side, houses, but they also have liquid assets, quite a lot. Like, why do people do that? Like, why they have to pay interest on the debt, but then they have financial assets as well that earn, that bring them a return. So what's the trade of that? Why wouldn't they have, I mean, one of them must, if the interest rate is higher, they have to pay than the, yeah. the interest rate they earn on the other side of the balance sheet. Why wouldn't they consolidate that and take it out? So people do a lot of things in household balance, a lot of things happen on household balance sheets that are not easily explained from a macro point of view. And I think it's like a fascinating field because here, um, you know, there's a lot of behavioral research that's going on. And I think this is exactly where macro and behavioral will, will meet and produce fascinating new, ins new insights. So Roberto, do you have a last word for us as we conclude? <laughs> yes, I think this uh, question of uh, gross magnitudes against uh, the the idea of uh, or what is, would be zero in the, from the, the global point of view is quite important. And uh, I think it raises, uh, besides the question of uh, seniorage, which has been uh, just hinted at in some past, which is, I think it's, it's a very crucial power in the hands of the central bank and of the banking system in general. But uh, what uh, uh, I would say is that uh, the problem of crisis, uh, uh, banking crisis and financial crisis and real, uh, extending to the real sector, raises the question of uh, who are the winners? I mean that uh, all this crash, all the, the crisis ultimately implies that uh, there has been a big redistribution of wealth because uh, if uh, 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 lending by the banks who have not, will not be uh, returned to the bank, this means that someone has appropriated some wealth uh, uh, and, uh, at the cost of someone else or some other. So what are the distributive results of the financial crisis? This is, I think, a very crucial question. Well, I think we could go on for hours. I think we are extraordinarily fortunate to have such a uh, highly qualified and uh, fabulous group of, of presenters. And I thought both of our discussants made wonderful points. We're grateful to them all. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay, team, that's it. <laughs>